Merhaba Mine Hocam, ben Kursa. Tamam, tamam hocam, bekliyorum. Tamam hocam. Tamam hocam. Merhaba hocam, bekliyorum. Erkan hocam, merhaba. Ee, sesim... Sesim, Sesim gelebiliyor mu? Erkan Hocam merhabalar. Ha, merhaba hocam. <gülüyor> Hasan Hocam merhaba. Ben şu an girmeyi bekliyorum. Onu bekliyorum. Hocam merhaba. Nasılsınız? Merhabalar. Teşekkürler. Siz nasılsınız? İyiyiz hocam. Sağ olun. Teşekkürler. Nasıl gidiyor hocam? İyi misiniz? Valla hızlı geçiyor çok. <gülüyor> Anlamadım. <gülüyor> Arkan hocam ben şimdi katılımcılarımızı kontrol ediyorum hemen. Kimler evet. katılmış diye bakıyorum hocam. Evet. Hocamız burada. Ha, evet. Ha, Simao hocamız Sara hocamız Hadi. burada mı diye bakıyorum. Sara burada değil şu anda. Devam ediyorum. Fahim Muhammed Buradan diye bakıyorum. Fahim Hoca burada. Ee, Müride Hoca ve Ahmet İyici Hoca'yı tepsilen Müride Hoca burada. İkra Hoca ve Tülay Hoca'lar buradalar. Ee, say sayma Hoca buradan diye bakıyorum. Evet kendisini göremedim hocam. Hocam şu an için e, iki katılımcımız e, göre göremedim. Ee, evet. Onun dışında hocalarımız burada. Siz dilediğiniz zaman hocam başlayabiliriz. İlk katılımcımız hocamız Hasan Hoca burada şu anda. Salonda da herhalde bizi izleyenler var mı bilmiyorum ama. Var, var hocam. First I would like to say welcome to all participants to our session. We are currently facing a very demanding schedule right now at the outset of my address. I would like to express my gratitude to Üsküdar University Faculty of Communication Dean uh, and uh, the organizer uh, Professor Süleyman Irvan. I would like to extend my congratulations uh, to him and his uh, entire team. Today we will be listening to six separate papers on the subject of distillation, culture and society for one hour and 45 minutes. We will have participants from different countries as I see. Our first speaker is uh, Assistant Professor Hasan Topaçoğlu, who will give a presentation on the topic Recent Trends in Navan Society Attitudes Towards Immigration, Nationalism and Identity. You have the microphone, Professor Topaçoğlu, please. Uh, okay, thank you very much. Uh, let me... Uh, can you enable me to share my screen? Hadi hocam. Okay, just to confirm you can see the slides, right? Yes. Okay. All right. Uh let's start then. Uh good afternoon everybody. Uh thank you for being here today. My name is Hasan Topaçoğlu. I am an assistant professor at Üsküdar University, also a visiting research scholar at the International Research Center for Japanese Studies in Kyoto, Japan. Currently, I am here, and uh, I am here for a research project related to Okinawa Islands. Uh, as site of that research project, I wanted to uh, do a little bit more research on the island, and uh, today I will be sharing my uh, survey that I conducted last year and uh, gathering the results this year and hoping to submit it as a research paper sometime soon. And uh, before starting, I think I need to a little bit uh, clarify and explain the situation uh, about Okinawa. Uh, Japan is usually known for being uh, quite a homogeneous society outside of the world, but that's not really entirely true. There are some minor two groups in Japan too. Uh, two main ones are known for the north of Japan, Hokkaido Island area as the Ainu culture, which is the oldest residence of Japanese islands. And the other one is uh, south uh, part of Japan, Okinawa Islands, which is known uh, uh, for uh, being Ryukyu Kingdom. 
in uh, in old times and 1600 it, it's occupied by Japan and then become the, the part of Japan. And in the Second World War was uh, invited by United States uh, in 1972, uh, it was uh, returned back to Japan again. But the, the main narrative about the island is usually considered as the Okinawan island people are not really Japanese, they are Ryukyuan. And uh, this narrative is mainly controlled by the two main uh, news organizations located on Okinawa Island. One is called Ryukyu Shinpo, the other one is called Okinawa Times. So I wanted to a little bit learn about the island and uh, see the current situation. Uh, what is the situation about the internationalization, identity, culturalization, multiculturalization and such. And uh, one thing that drove me into this research is since I came to Japan this time, I realized seeing more and more news, uh, like you can see in the slide right now, um, as part of the shrinking population, Japan uh, decided to accept more and more foreigners. And of course, this dynamic presents various challenges for Japanese society and encompassing issues of internationalization, multiculturalization, nationalism and identity. And uh, so the situation on the, the Okinawan island is actually the same. Uh, the foreigners, foreign residents on the island is also on the rise, uh, currently close to 10% per, per year. Uh, so one thing is evident, uh, the changes uh, coming to Japan as well, Jap Japanese society will change, and uh, and it's happening quite fast as well. So I wanted to see what their reaction reactions for this change. That was basically my main motivation. Um, so for the introduction part, I uh, prepared a slide like this one. Some organizations anticipate that the proportion of foreigners living in Japan will reach. 10% of the total population by either 2040 or 2050. Regardless of the timeline, uh, the demographic shift is expected to prompt more frequent discussions in Japan about concepts such as relations with foreigners, ethnic identity, internationalization, and even hopefully Japanese-ness, because this is a big topic, that's why I'm saying hopefully, what is the true meaning of being Japanese? Uh, what are the prevailing perspectives among the people of Okinawa regarding, regarding these concepts? How do Okinawans perceive the increasing foreign population on the island, their interactions with foreigners, the process of internationalization, Japan's initiatives in the area, its positions in Asia, their own sense of identity and other related topics? So this study investigates the current trends in Okinawa concerning these issues. And for this, when I was looking for a survey, I came uh, across with this National Identity International Social, Social Survey program. Uh, it's in Europe. Uh, it was conducted three times, in, uh, as you can see in the slide, in different times, more than 40 countries. Uh, more than 50 social science professors came together and created the survey. It was conducted in Turkey as well. It's open access. Anyone can check it uh, and cr uh, uh, cross-reference the different countries as well. So I uh, asked the, the the program if I can use it and they politely accepted it and I ran the same survey. And the survey outline is as follows. <clears throat> the location is Okinawa main island and uh, Naha city, Okinawa city, Chatan area, Nago area, main streets, cafes, restaurants, libraries, museums, uh, universities. I've been quite many places for this in-person, face-to-face, random sampling. 304 uh, respondents were collected for this. and uh, But for the results that I will show you in a while, uh, you are not going to see in total number of 304 for each question because uh, we couldn't really force everybody to answer each and every question. In our control group, we are, I realized that it's uh, not going to be too easy. So uh, I will first give the results and after that I will uh, give the conclusion part, but I will have to rush quite a lot because we don't have much time. So if uh, some of the things don't make sense, don't hesitate to ask it in QA session. So as a first thing, participant profile, uh, male, female uh, ratio was quite balanced, but for age group, as you can see, most of our participants were actually uh, quite young people. 
And for the uh, the question, if, whether they are citizens of Japan, uh, all of them are citizens of Japan, and almost all of them were both uh, they were both were citizens of Japan. Their parents as well, and their parents were also almost all of them were born and raised in Japan. And uh, whether they are married or not, most of them are single. Uh, being young people and mostly university students, I think this is also quite understandable. Their average income was uh, 53, 54% was less than a million. Again, being young and mostly student, I think this is also quite normal. Their household income was uh, roughly around 5 to 10 million, which can be considered as the middle class to upper middle class families in Japan. And their school education situation, 70% of them going to college right now, university students. And uh, for the attended school time period, as you can see, uh, most of them have had education or have been having education for 12, 13, 14, 15 years. That's again being university student. Uh, so in, in some sense, it's actually above the average of education level. Uh, what kind of place do you currently live in? They are from many, various parts from the island. So some of them are from small cities. Some of them are from uh, local towns, uh, suburban areas. So it's quite uh, scattered around the island, I would say. Uh, so about the main questions after the profiles, uh, it starts from here, actually. The first question was, how close do you feel to? Uh, feel to meaning feel close to is understood as emotionally attached to or you identify yourself with it's called aichaku uh, the your own town or city was quite high your prefecture was quite high as well uh, i think the important part was the third one there uh Emotionally attached to Japan part was quite high too, because uh, this is interesting because, as I said, the main narrative by the uh, media uh, controlled by the Okinawan outlets uh, usually uh, say that Okinawan people are not really Japanese, they are, they are Rukyuan. So this kind of like contradicts with the main narrative that's being told to us. Some people say the following things are important for being truly Japanese. Others say they are not important. How how important do you think each each of the following is? Uh, the important ones were to have a Japanese citizenship was quite high and to feel Japanese was quite high too. I think this is quite important. And uh, the last one, to have a Japanese an ancestry, was actually quite low. So in, in, in their responses we can see that the bloodline is not really as important as one might think according to their uh, answers also to be a believer in buddhism or shinto was actually among the lowest so uh, like being truly japanese and religion actually has uh, nothing to do with it next one is how much do you agree or disagree with the following statement uh th there uh national identity towards Japan in, in this question uh, answers came out quite clear actually it's quite high the important answers were I would rather be a citizen of, citizen of Japan than of any other country in the world quite high generally speaking Japan is a better country than most of other countries is quite high and uh, I think uh, yeah when my country does well in sports I'm quite proud and I am often less proud of Japan than I would like to be. That, that it again shows their expectation, which again requires some self, uh, sense of uh, identity and uh, belonging towards the country, I guess. And uh, people should support their country, even if the country is in the wrong, is the lowest. And this is kind of uh, interesting because I checked for this specific answer, I, I checked uh, other countries as well. Uh, ironically, for this question, uh, quite the opposite way was number one was Turkey. Uh, among all the countries, more than 40 countries, uh, Turkey was saying people should support their country even if the country is in the wrong. Uh, strongly agree and agree were number one answers. How proud are you of Japan in the, each of the following? Scientific and technological achievements, achievements in sports, art and literature, these were quite high, but the lowest one was its political influence in the world. Uh, 
I am moving forward to the next one. How much do you agree, disagree with the following statements? Um, so here it was again, actually relations between Japan and other countries. The results were like uh, quite, Japan should uh, move forward along with the other international bodies uh, in accordance to foreigners should not, the important part was I think foreigners should not be allowed to buy land in Japan. Answer was quite high. I will move forward. We can turn back later. Uh, how much do you agree or disagree with the following statement? Again, related to relations between Japan and other countries. Uh, the, the Okinawan people were saying that free trade leads to better products becoming available in Japan is quite high. And uh, also, like the next one is, uh, I think, sorry, uh, this one is quite, again, uh, related to what I just showed you. Uh, so, the long story short, it was like uh, the foreign products should come to the country. They are not harmful to us. Actually, it makes our life better kind of answers were quite prominent. Uh, moving to about minorities part, how much do you agree, disagree with the following statement? The first one was it's impossible for people who do not share Japan's customs and traditions to become fully Japanese. Uh, the, the number one answer was agree but still it was not really a uh, very clearly uh, strongly chosen choice here because the other choices were quite high too. But for the next one, ethnic minorities should be given government assistance, to preserve their customs and traditions. This one was, I think, quite clearly high. So when it comes to ethnic minorities, they say that, yes, uh, we should actually, should we given government assistance to preserve customs and traditions. And again, uh, again, minorities in Japan, some say it's better for a country uh, if different racial and national, uh, ethnic groups maintain their distinct customs and traditions. And others say it's better if these groups adopt and blend in the society. Uh, the 74% said it's better for society if groups maintain their distinct customs and traditions. So they are for uh, actually maintaining their customs and traditions. But... When it comes to immigrants, uh, their answer close to 90% is immigrants should retain their culture of origin and also adopt Japanese culture, which is uh, a little bit, not completely, but a little bit uh, separating from the previous one. Moving forward again about the immigrants, they have positive uh, views about immigration, actually. Immigrants, we can see it very clearly here. Immigrants are generally good for Japan's economy, is quite high. And legal immigrants to Japan who are not citizens should have the same rights as Japanese citizens is, again, quite high. Uh, legal, legal immigrants should have equal access to public education as Japanese citizens is, again, quite high. And the low uh, answer was Japan's cultural ge culture is generally undermined by immigrants. So uh, there is no any kind of uh, clear uh, opposition against the uh, immigrants here. Uh, However, when you look at the next one, do you think the number of immigrants to Japan nowadays should be? Uh, the highest choice was actually remain the same as it is. So it's like, uh, please do not raise it any further. And Okinawa, by the way, is one of the highest uh, foreign national percentage place that uh, among all the other cities in Japan. And when we look at these people, do they actually have any kind of an interaction with foreigners? Actually, it's, as you can see, they, one way or another, almost all of them uh, have kind of an uh, attract uh, the relationship with the foreigners living on the island. Never hanged out with any kind of a foreigner answer was only 69 people. How proud are you of being Japanese? Uh, we can see that they are quite proud of uh, Japan and uh, and for this, the patriotic feelings in Japan, they think that patriotic feelings for Japan is quite good, strengthen Japan's place in the world, are needed for Japan to remain united. And again, uh, the lowest answer was lead to negative attitudes toward immigrants in Japan. So again, they are not really any kind of like... Uh, heavy uh, strong. Uh, Sorry? Summarize because we are over of our time right now. Sorry, okay. I am moving forward to the conclusion part then. Can I have two minutes for this then? Thank you. Uh, yeah. so, so, okay, I'm just...
Okay. Uh, since the survey was conducted in Okinawa, only in Okinawa, direct comparison uh, is not feasible. Uh, it has been uh, 10 years since the ISPS, uh, ISSP previously conducted survey in central Tokyo and the demographic landscape of Japan, particularly in terms of the proportion of foreigners, has undergone significant changes since then. Therefore, we consider the results of this study to reflect current trends specific to the island of Okinawa. Uh, for those interested in the Japan, I think uh, should uh, have another survey for it. While the study achieved male-female balance through random sampling, it did not sufficiently ensure balance across age groups, resulting in the sample predominantly composed of young people. To address this limitation, future analysis could benefit from cross-referencing to reveal differences between various age groups. And uh, I think, okay, then I will just move forward to the last, uh, the last page and say that, so we can see there's a change in the society of Okinawa, as we were told that uh, Okinawan people are actually not Japanese, they are Ryukyuan. Uh, there is a change here. It's different than what we have been told. So uh, is this the style of the survey or age factor or changing society? This part is, I think, open to discussion and interpretation. But one thing is clear that there is uh, the Japanese society and Okinawan society are changing. Uh, I'm sorry for taking longer time and thank you for listening. Thank you very much, uh, Hassan Hocam. I wonder if there is an, a similar study in Turkey, because this is a very interesting question for Turkey too. Maybe you can uh, conduct a study in Turkey and compare them. Uh, there is all that it has already been done in Turkey to, through Sabancı University. So this survey, the same survey was conducted in more than 40 countries, Turkey included. And for Turkish uh, leg, the Sabancı University did it. The uh, results are open public as well, open access data. Uh, I did check it, but I cannot remember too much detail about it. Only that part, if the country is in the wrong, should we support it? Turkey was the highest. Yes, we should, even if the country is in the wrong. It's very nice. Thank you very much. Now we have a second part present presenter. Uh, I Can I see Professor Jaho Simao? Yes, he is here, I think. Dr. Sara or Dr. Hoa? Yok herhalde değil mi arkadaşlar? Afrika'da iyi siyasi yetkilerin kendi kesimde parti eğitimi. Bir aradan ses geliyor ama. Siyaset nasıl yapılır? Bunu da kuzunu bulmuşlar. Ve son yıl boyunca tüm masrafların kendileri karşılayarak oradaki genç siyasetçilere bunun eğitimini verilmek için. Ve benim bilgilerle arasında başlıyoruz. Teşvik geçişim çalışmaları. Onu da açarsak biraz. Siz de duyuyor musunuz? Bir ses geliyor ama. Yes, we are hearing outside noise. Dr. Fahim from Pondicherry University. Yeah, hi. I'm already yeah, I'm going to ask to you. Um, could you open, please, your uh, video, please? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Where are you from? Hi, hi. Good afternoon. I'm Fahim. Afternoon. I'm from. Uh, I'm a PhD scholar in the Department of Electronic Media Mass Communication, Pondicherry University, India. India, yes, very yeah. nice. Yeah. Uh, shall I share my screen? Yes. Yeah. It's going to talk about biometric bodies and emerging governmental TVs, the rise of datafication and making of health in the uh, India. I'll tell in India, yeah. yeah. Please. Yeah, sh shall I start? Yes, thank you. Yeah, yeah, I, I would like I to have a my... ring. Sorry. This? So I have a ring with me on my desk. Can you hear it? When you hear it, uh, you have only two minutes, okay? Yeah, yeah, cool. Yeah. yeah, I would like to present my working paper, Biometric Bodies and Emerging Government Dialities, The Rise of Identification and the Making of Health ID in India. 
India has witnessed rapid digitalization of its health sector in the last decade, along with finance and governance. The state's push towards digitalization of health has serious implications for how healthcare is availed and experienced by the people, especially the poor. Ministry of Health and Family Welfare released the National Digital Health Blueprint in April 2019 under the vision of National Health Policy 2017. This policy is an action plan to digitalize health records at the district level, maintain registries for important diseases, and link primary healthcare services with referral care. A major shift in healthcare infrastructure has been marked by a turn towards the digitalization of health information and the creation of a unique health identification number, known as UHID. Information infrastructures are established and maintained to streamline access to healthcare and welfare in India. The Indian government have shown peculiar interest in shif shifting towards a biometric-based identity system for verifying welfare beneficiaries over the last few years. India launched its flagship digital health mission, the Aishman Bharat Digital Mission, or ABDM, in August 2020. ABDM aims to develop and support the integrated digital health infrastructure of the country, and it is supposed to bridge the existing gap among different stakeholders of the healthcare ecosystem through digital innovation. It creates a system of personal health records, easily accessible to individuals and healthcare professionals and service providers based on individuals' informed consent. So the components of uh, ABDM comes in five layers. The first one is Ayushman Bharat Health Account or ABA number. It's a 14-digit identifier designed to distinguish individuals within India's digital healthcare infrastructure. And Health Facility Registry is a comprehensive repository for public and private health facilities, including hospitals, clinics, diagnostic laboratories, imaging centers, and pharmacies. Healthcare Personal Registry comprehensively accounts for a registration of every working professionals involved in the del delivery of healthcare services. And uni Unified Health Interface enables a wide variety of digital services between patients and health service providers or HSPs, including appointment booking, teleconsultation, survey discovery, and others. And the last one, known as ABBA app, is a personal health report that comes within the format of a digital application through which patients can maintain and monitor their health information, which is linked to the Aishman Bharat Health Account. So in this paper, I employed a qualitative approach and uh, used multi sectoral ethnography as suggested by STAR 2002. The study was conducted in the South Indian states of Puducherry and Kerala. The paper adopts science and technology studies approach to capture the social formations within the technical assemblages, in-depth interviews of multiple actors, including patients or beneficiaries, healthcare professionals, accredited social health activists or ASHA workers, technicians and administrators or officials were conducted. Further, Field observations of ABA enrollment, creation of ABA ID, ABA linking with PMJY, and patients' access to healthcare with ABA was observed. Uh, the study draws on a Foucauldian approach towards public health. Uh, it offers a critical analysis of biometric based health identity systems in India with the case of ABDM and ABA. So, ABA account or ABA number serves as a unique identity linked to ADA, world's largest biometric system. ADA, the world's largest biometric system, which facilitates enrollment in personal health records and the public in, public insurance scheme, Pradhan Madhuri Jan Arogya Yojana or PMJY. Aishman Bharat PMJY is the largest world is the world's largest public health insurance scheme, which aims at providing a health cover of rupees five lakhs per family a year for secondary and tertiary care hospitalization to over 12 crore poor and vulnerable families, which accounts for approximately 55 crores beneficiaries of India. That forms the bottom 40 percentage of the Indian population. By April 2023, 380 million ABA numbers have been issued and over 262 million health records have been digitalized and linked with their ABA number. A person can access their health records from admission to treatment and discharge through ABA as it facilitates longitudinal digital health records of an individual with disease history and previous treatment. However, it is yet to be materialized in its full fledged form. It is mostly, yeah, in some of the states, it is, more, it, it is yet to be implemented. Though ABA is supposed to work on voluntary consent based linking and sharing of personal health records, ABA numbers have already been automatically generated for every Indian citizen who has been vaccinated from India often without their knowledge and consent. 
an interoperable digital health infrastructure with biometric authentication of beneficiaries or patient care or patients require the linking of ABA with Aadhaar. When linked with Aadhaar, ABA ID will feature the demographic as well as biometric data of the beneficiary in the national portal. Linking ABA with Aadhaar and the mobile number of an individual makes it imperative to consider the data protection and privacy of users or beneficiaries given multiple instances of data breaches in other over the years. When ABA is not a mandatory identity, some states in India, including Pondicherry, has made ABA mandatory for enrollment into the public insurance scheme, PMJY. A biometric-based health identity system that stores and maintains health records of individuals for a severe threat to marginal populations, including those who belong to gender, sexual, religious, and caste minorities who are already facing systemic, systemic discrimination. The history of Aurora argues that the history of global data infrastructures reiterates how information systems have been transformed into surveillance weapons against the marginalized. In India, it is important to note that the mandatory linking of other with the health, health welfare has prompted HIV positive people to drop out of treatment programs across India, fearing privacy violations. Mandatory requirement of ABA for availing public insurance and its opaque data protection policy was a severe threat of surveillance. Masiro and Shakti has highlighted the importance of Aadhaar within wider techno-social formation, suggesting the massive potential of Aadhaar technology to be linked with other identity systems and the portability as well as mobility of digitally stored biometric data. Coming to governmentality and biopower, Foucault has located the historical functions of the clinic as a site of biopower. For Foucault, power is embodied in the day-to-day -day practices of the medical profession and medical institutions. Governmentality, which emerged in the 18th century, is a mechanism for the regulating and controlling populations through a practice of security. As the global economy develops into a culture of risk, the national state is forced to invest more and more in internal systems of governmentality. The making of a unique health ID in India, followed by Aadhaar, can be seen as a technique of governance, keeping count of the population and engaging in the constant monitoring of the citizen body. This paper investigates the norms of governmentalities in data education as enrollment into health identity systems and public databases becomes a condition for citizens' right to access health care and welfare. When ABA ID is embraced, embraced as a model for biometric-based health identity systems. It places citizen bodies at the mercy of socio-technical systems for recognition, authorization, and verification of identity. Mishaps in fingerprint reading, complexities in iris scanning, delayed OTPs, and server issues often complicate access to digital health and welfare for the poor of India. The mandatory requirement to be enrolled into public databases often formats citizens bodies into data sets. Navigating through multiple ID systems, including ABA, Aadhaar, and PMJY, often confuses people and places the burden of being updated in the ID systems for availing welfare and healthcare. Welfare and healthcare. In some cases, people were not even aware of what one particular, particular ID is meant for. For instance, they mistake the ABA card for PMJY insurance, which has serious implications for their health. To conclude, Paper raises concerns about the challenges in authorization and verification and the misuse of personal data, underscoring the complex social implications of UHID implementation. Following Rao, it explores the division between identification and identity, highlighting UHID as a socially mediated process of creating or denying the conditions for recognition. The emergence of digital identity platforms and unique health ID shapes state citizen relations as citizen bodies and identities are formed and renegotiated in and through multiple identity systems. The rise of identification and the push of biometric ID systems often come with a potential threat of surveillance and privacy violation. I, I conclude the sentence that when public health infrastructures become repositories of mass data, they produce relations in which the state builds control over its subjects and their lived experiences. And thank you. Thank you, Mr. Fahim, especially for the good yeah. timing. Thank you very much. Yeah. And next we have uh, navigating com consumer perceptions, a, a comparative study among North Faces, viral CGE ADS and traditional ADS, uh, written by Mirido Zansevich and Ahmed Ije. Thank you.
We can hear you right now. Could you open your microphone? Okay. Hello? Hi. Is our presentation visible? Yes, yes, no problem. Uh, first of all, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Ahmed and my colleague Mirda um, from Eastern Mediterranean University in North Cyprus. Um, we conducted a research entitled Navigating Consumers' Perspe uh, Perceptions, a comparative study among North Asia's viral CGI and guerrilla ads. Um, to begin with, um, lately, most of the industries have undergone a significant transformation due to the rapid improvements in the digital technology. Advertising industry is the one of the sectors that adopted their strategies and approaches into the advanced digital technologies, such as artificial intelligence platforms. The major novelty that transformed advertising industry is the usage of CGI advertising, which refers to the computer-generated imagery that are designed by using artificial intelligence platforms um, to generate visually striking um, contents and realistic contents that cannot be captured on the camera in real life. CGI advertising always compared to um, guerrilla advertising, outdoor advertising, um, and some scholars go further and called it as um, digital guerrilla. Even though the bot forms um, uses extreme elements to surprise people or shock people, um, they are different than each other. For example, CGI is completely virtual, um, uses extreme elements and wow effects in their strategies, but the guerrilla advertising completely physical and ensures a um, physical experience to their audiences. Given all, um, lack of literature on CGI and guerrilla advertising, especially comparative studies and on com uh, cost customer perceptions towards the, these types of advertising made us possible to conduct this research to better analyze. Also, we used um, diffusion of innovation theory to better understand how digital um, natives for um, especially understand and consume such novelties in society. Therefore, our initial purpose is to um, investigate the paradigm shift in the advertising industry, then to gather um, intergenerational opinions regarding the CGI and guerrilla advertising, then use North Face's companies' um, ad adverts to reveal opinions towards such ads, then conducting a content analysis on two CGI and two guerrilla advertisements of North Face company as a case to reveal codes and match them with the cognitive and affective domains of advertising. And the, finally, this research aims to discover customer engagements and experiences with the brand by addressing audiences' memorability and recalling features via focus group research to support the findings on the content analysis. Um, moving to the research questions, as you can see on the screen, uh, based on the aims of the research, um, four research questions have been um, established to investigate the subject matter um, and narrow down the topic. Um, the first question aimed to address customers' perceptions and brand engagement. And then the second question um, concerns with the customer experiences and perceptions regarding the CGI ads and guerrilla ads. And then the third question addresses emotional impact of CGI ads, while the last question focuses on intergenerational opinions towards the CGI ads advertised. Um, as we mentioned, the framework of advertising, cognitive, affective, and quantitative model, um, it is better to explain them. Cognitive domain concerns with the how advertising messages are designed to capture attention, convey messages, persuade audience, and contribute to the, the contribute to the audience's thinking processes with the product that is being advertised. And then affective domain reflects how advertising messages um, help people to develop feelings 
and emotional attachments towards the product or the service. Uh, and the conative is the behavioral framework that concerns with the buying behavior and the actual purchasing process. Given all, um, this research employs qualitative content analysis and the focus group study. It is a two-dimensional research where researchers initially analyze two CGI and two guerrilla advertising uh, of the North Face company, and then analyze with the content analysis, adopting cognitive and affective framework of advertising. And then we conducted a uh, focus group study to validate the uh, researches uh, with eight participants, four from Y generation and four from Z generation to obtain deeper information about intergenerational opinions and perceptions towards CGI ads and guerrilla ads chosen. And then we uh, these selection criteria were for samples for purposive sampling has been adopted to select Y and Z generations according to the research aims and the uh, in the focus group research. Now we are um, I'm leaving the microphone to my colleague to um, explain the analysis process. Good afternoon. Uh, to reveal whether uh, those ads address the cognitive or frame or affective framework, we choose North Face brands two CGI and two guerrilla ads as demonstrated on the screen. So as you can see here, two ads above are uh, North Face's guerrilla ads, this one and this one, and two ads below uh, are CGI ads. So let's move to analysis part. The first one is North Face's uh, guerrilla ads about the uh, red jacket. In this image, uh, the building is dressed in a red jacket of North Face. As illustrated in the picture, uh, the use of the red color captures uh, the audience at first glance. So based on the roots from uh, neuromarketing and psychology, uh, colors have meanings and influences on the uh, over people's feelings. So the red color is linked to uh, excitement, uh, courage, passion, etc., And it is warm and positive color that directly influences the sentiments of the audience towards the ad positively. Also, the rest of building uh, with a popular product directly contributes to feelings of safety, unity, care, and thus, people feel like home and develop close relationship with the brand. On the other side, uh, even though all these effective outcomes indirectly contribute to the creation of a cognitive domain, further solid codes have, uh, have been identified. As you can see here, uh, there is a North Face and Gucci brand corporate logos. So we can understand this is the collaboration of two powerful brands. And it, which is cultivate trustworthiness and credibility. So the, the powerful stance uh, of the building evolves the uh, strength of the brand. A uh, large and impressive building was chosen to make the brand easily recognizable, uh, perceivable, and memorable. The second ad is Himalayan Suites. Uh, this product of North, si uh, North uh, Faces is Himalayan Suites. So the North Face has created a store where people can explore and uh, experience North Face's product and equipment in Shanghai. Uh, the yellow color that symbolizes North Face company makes people young, uh, energetic, happy, and dynamic. Also, the second half of the uh, ad shows the audience a figure in a human shape who is placed with welcoming open arms and a friendly stance. So on the cognitive, le cognitive level, uh, the company takes a step to inform audience about its uh, brand and product via corporate logo. The color that we classified under the affective domain works as a recalling factor, helps for perceiving easily considering the dimension of the ad. So the third advertisement is uh, CGI ads, so let's watch them, watch it first. Okay. 
Yes. Here uh, we see one of the North Face's most popular jacket, the retro Naps jacket, display on one of London's most iconic uh, landmarks, Big Ben. Uh, additionally, additionally, in front of the Big Ben, uh, we see people who are talking about this uh, huge jacket and are also wear they are also wearing uh, North Face's jacket. In the process of analysis, uh, using the yellow color cultivates feeling of youthfulness, optimism, and happiness. Also, a creative concept used in advertisements and the limitless possibilities it presents appeals to the affective dimension of the advertisement. When moved to the cognitive dimension, we can clearly see the logo on the product, which makes it easy for people uh, to recognize that, that the product from North Face. And additionally, the use of yellow color of retro Napsi jacket helps people recall the brand. And the choice of Big Ben as the location also facilitates easy recall of the North Face brand again. Yeah. The second one is, again, the other uh, CGI ads. Here we see that North Face's, uh, North Face brands put the black jackets on the uh, New York Empire State. In this CGI ad, the wall effect and adoption to reality are the leading codes that identify during the content analysis. At first glance, uh, the audience is impressed uh, by the dimension because it is a very huge and popular building. Cognitive aspects of the ads created by the logo to introduce uh, the brand and make people think, understand, and process what they've consumed. So the nature of the ad seems catchy and being realistic and 3D facilitates recognition, remembering, and recalling all the product and brand. So at this point, let's continue with the focus group analysis. Um, the reason behind conducting a focus group is to validate and reinforce what we found from the content analysis. So focus group conduct, conducted with 4Y and 4Z generation to have a comparative and intergenerational insight on CGI and guerrilla ads. The focus group interviews analyzed to thematic analysis by revealing quotes and matching them with cognitive and affective dimensions. As depicted in the table, uh, several quotes have been identified and uh, matched with domains, such as the use of uh, visually striking elements, the use of elements that evoke emotions, and color usage influencing participants' feelings, and apart from the major effective codes, using informative elements such as local persuasive elements has been identified under the cognitive domain. So all these codes and themes will be explained in detail in the findings part. So the findings of this research uh, are as follows. Why, while why Jan find CGI as more exciting, Jan Z find CGI as captivating and compelling than the guerrilla ads. Both Gen Y and Z find North Face's CGI ads more effective and impressive than the guerrilla ads because uh, CGI ads facilitate remembering and recalling advertised products. And Gen Z desire to consume CGI ads that are digitally striking. And both Gen Y and Z find CGI ads more engaging and innovative to attach positive feelings. Jan Z declared that the CGI ads were uh, more understandable. And both of them agreed that Guerrilla and CGI ads easily gone viral on social media so everyone can see and share it. More into the final part. So this comparative qualitative study content analysis on two CGI ads and two guerrilla ads of North Face and focus group study on CGI and guerrilla ads concluded that even though mainstream advertising theories mostly underline the cognitive roots of advertisement like increasing awareness, digitalization enable ads to possess significant roots in effective domain as well. 
also it was concluded that digital natives see for digital oriented content in uh, ads compared to y gen and who still expect traditional ads at some extent However, CGI ads become more effective and creative than guerrilla ads among both Y and Z generations. And all these arguments confirm that the diffusion of innovations are adopted and appreciated by Z generation within the society. Also, it can be concluded that the Z generation is technology-driven individuals, while uh, Y generation is the uh, traditional uh, ads. So thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Yurige Özen and Ahmet Yüji. And right now, next presentation, uh, I think our friend today, Atay Hoca, uh, will be presenting. She's going to talk about from trolls to Trailblazers, actually, I don't know what it is. Resilience and resistance among women journalists in the digital sphere. Could you please explain what trailblazers means firstly? Thank you very much. Good to see you. Um, hello, Professor Yüksel Erkan Hocam. Uh, good to see you too. Uh, I think I uh, spoke yesterday, I attended face-to-face uh, -face sessions and I covered my part. Now, um, the, the, the first other, my lovely Pakistani um, sister friend, um, Ikra Iqbal, uh, actually will give uh, the idea uh of um uh, this presentation uh so um uh, i really would like to be happy um to be part of this conference this symposium uh, especially uh the um the the opportunity that professor uh, yuxel is the moderator of our session so um, uh, let me um, give uh, the uh, uh, floor to um, Ikra Iqbal. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Tule, for inviting me and uh, making me highlight in this session. Thank you so much, uh, organization, for providing me opportunity to be a part of this symposium. Uh, can I share the screen first? Yes, I have given you the permissions. Yes, to yes, share. you have to. Is my presentation uh, available on the screen? We lost. Is yes. it visible? Yes. Okay. Uh, hello, everyone. The topic which I'm going to present today that is from trolls to tribalizers, the resilience and uh, resistance among women journalists in the digital sphere. Why I chose this topic? Uh, this topic is very interesting and uh, which is not covered so much because. Uh, uh, violence against female journalists is a very significant issue, which is not, uh, you know, media organizations are not highlighting so much. Uh, how they are female journalists, they are getting trolled on online platform, and that is giving them an energy to protect themselves and not to give up and to fight against these uh, cyber bullies and cyber attacks. That's why I chose this topic to work on that. And this is, uh, I'm going, I'm from University of Technology, Mara, PhD scholar, plus also a uh, lecturer at the University of Central Punjab, Pakistan. I have worked on this topic along with my colleague, Dr. Thul Ethe from Hatem Mustafa Kumar University. Moving toward the topic, this uh, research paper, presentation is based on these points 
This is the table of content, introduction, literature, review, theoretical framework, methodology, results, and conclusion. Going toward the introduction, rapid changes in digital media have brought both opportunities and challenges to journalism. Gender biases and systematic inequalities persist within the journalism industry and society. Women journalists face various forms of online harassment and discrimination. The, this issue stems for historical power dynamics perpetuating misogyny in media. Women journalists experience intersectional marginalization due to factors like race, ethnic, and socioeconomic status. Understanding these intersecting oppressions is crucial to understand the challenges faced by women journalists. To find in detail the consequences of online harassment, this research is basically based on three research questions. First one is that what type of online harassment and discrimination do women journalists in Pakistan and England face? And how do these experiences impact their personal and professional lives? The second question is based on the what strategies and coping mechanism do they employ to preserve and resist against these challenges? And the third one question is that how do intersectional factors such as race, ethnicity, religion, and socioeconomic status shape the unique experiences and resilient strategies of women journalists in both countries? The objective of this study to enhance the understanding of gender dynamics, power relations, and digital culture in journalism also to inform practical interventions and policies for creating safer, inclusive environment for female journalists. Literary review, cyber harassment. Cyber bullying, th threats of violence, sexual harassment, doxing, and misogynistic trolls are common form of online harassment against women journalists. Discrimination may manifest as gender stereotypes, unequal access to resources, and differential treatment in newsroom. It has impacts on women journalists. Or online harassment significantly affect mental health, job satisfaction, and sense of safety. It leads to increased stress, anxiety, burnout, and self-censorship. Digital intersectional perspective. Studies shown digital platform can exacerbate inequalities with marginalized groups facing discrimination and exclusion. For instance, women of color may encounter compounded form of discrimination experiences both gendered and racialized harassment. Despite these challenges, gen digital intersectionality literature also explores strategies for empowerment and resistance. Online communities, activism, and digital storytelling provide avenues for marginalized groups to reclaim narratives and advocate for social changes. This study supports two theoretical frameworks, social feminist theory that highlights systematic inequalities and power dynamics in digital journalism, while intersectionality theory acknowledges the complexity of women journalists' identities and experiences. By considering how gender intersects with other factors such as race, ethnicity, and class, the study aims to provide a non-understanding of challenges faced by women journalists. This study employs a qualitative approach conducting in-depth interviews with female journalists from Pakistan and England. Participants are selected purposely based on their experience of online harassment and discrimination. Thematic analysis is used to identify the pattern and themes in interview data. Ethical concentration included obtaining informed consent and ensuring confidentiality. Limitation may arise from uh, factors such as sample size and geographical scope. There are main three themes are identified from the interviews with female journalists from both countries and the analysis are describing as the similarities and differences of uh, consequences and uh, situations faced by female journalists from Pakistan and England. The first main theme is experiences of online harassment and discrimination. 
that contains the subcategory similarities and form of online abuse, psychological impacts, differences between Pakistan and England of psychological impacts, and cultural, societal, and intersectional discrimination. Second main theme, resilience strategies adopted by female journalists in both countries contain digital self-presentation sub-theme and online community building. The third main theme, intersectional identities and multiple marginalized marginalizabilities further explains the experiences of female journalists of color, compounded discrimination in England, religious and ethnic marginalization in Pakistan, class and socioeconomic factor that barriers for working class women in England that leads to the uh, consequences faced by female journalists. Based on the first theme, experience of online harassment, form of online abuse, and uh, Ms. Ghani, uh, female journalists from both countries have been victim of uh, online abuse and uh, they have encountered with multiple types of attacks such as stalking, doxing, uh, bullying, hacking attack. But due to the time limitation, I'm going to pick the most significant quotations from both countries' participants. From Pakistan, the one female journalist participant said that the comments I received were often laced with Ms. Kone's stick slurs and crude remarks about my appearance. Moreover, I have received threatening messages and my account was hacked. On the other hand, England female participant answered, I have confronted online harassment in sexism messages to real threats of violence. Someone posted my home address and contact details on social media. The psychological and professional impacts of these attacks are from Pakistan, the constant barrage of hateful messages and threats really took a troll on my mental health. It made me a question my choice to pursue journalism. England respondent answered, the online abuse made me feel scared and I was unable to perform my professional duties effectively. I was constantly in fear that someone would come to my door and attack me and was unable to sleep for a few months properly. Further uh, sub themes, cultural and societal changes in Pakistan. That is showing the differences in both countries. Pakistani society following the societal and cultural value the most. And most of the females are getting victim of discrimination just because of the male dominant society culture. Female journalists from Pakistan, they have been targeted of a cultural and societal taboos perspective such as uh, some roles and jobs are defined only for male and some roles are predefined for female. So if they try to work beyond their uh, parameters, they are considered a negative personality. The same participant from Pakistan highlighted in our society, there are still strong resistance to women having a voice in public sphere and define traditional gender roles. People comment on my profile that I don't have moral values as I work in this profession of journalism. On the other hand, intersectional discrimination faced in England was totally another nature. As a woman of color in the journalism industry, I faced not only sexism but also racism and microaggressions online and offline. The attacks often intersected targeting my gender and my radical identity simultaneously. In England, people, they were not having such issues as Pakistani participants had, such as being a female, you cannot do this, you cannot do that. Female participants from England, they were much independent to choose their career and society was not uh, judging their choice, but they had another type of uh, discriminative intersectional issues such as marginalized if immigrants are coming uh, people are not accepting them easily or marginalized our group are getting different kind of issues resilience strategies adopted by both countries participants digital self presentation in both countries after being trolled on online platform they have decided to tackle with this situation 
and find out the solution. And instead of leaving this profession, they prefer to continue and raise the awareness of that. From Pakistan, one participant answered, I refuse to hide or censor myself online. I shared the screenshot of personal messages sent in my profile. In England, participant defined, I use my platform to call out instances of sexism and equality in the industry. It's the way for me to resist and create change. Differences, personalized and professional accounts. In Pakistan, uh, it's observed that few participants, they have decided to create a separate personal account instead of uh, managing everything from the main account where they were being a victim of violence. But from England, no one tried to create a second account. They just continued with their main profile account and uh, tackled the situation. So that was the one difference identified from the participant discussion. The second main uh, resilience strategies sub theme is online community building. Both countries participant, they used platform to gain the support from the network. Uh, in Pakistan, participant highlighted the online support group has been a good platform to share experiences of cyber harassment. Knowing that I'm not alone in this fight has given me courage to keep going on. In England, throughout our online collective, we have been able to put pressure on media organization to address systematic biases and create more inclusive environment. So in both countries, participant, they used in positive way online community platform and they gain support networking system. Differences, it's seen that in the same also consequences phase in uh, from Pakistan side that uh, at online platform participant highlighted in our online group, we can discuss culture and societal pressure. Unfortunately, it didn't help much as organizations are not paying attention to this issue. They could only share their experiences in such groups, but media organizations or policy makers, they were not paying attention to create a safer environment or to provide any facilities for the protection of female journalists in Pakistan. But on the other hand, in England, marginalized voices were heard. These platforms were used to create more uh, coverage re relevant to this issue in media. As participant discussed in our online collective has been instrumental in pushing for greater representation and inclusion of women's perspective in media coverage. Moving toward the final intersectional identities and multiple marginalized theme, compounded discrimination in England, British female journalists of color face intersectional discrimination based on race, ethnicity, and gender. As a black woman, I have to, I have had to deal with not only sexism, but also racism and xenophobia. On the other hand, Pakistani women, especially from religious perspective, they've been a victim of a hate speech at online platform. Uh, Christian female journalists, they highlighted uh, their issue uh, consequences or uh, issues faced at cyber platform, digital platform relevant to their intersectional identity that they were victim of uh, her, uh, online harassment just because of they are having opposite faith system. As a religious minority in Pakistan, I face not only greater gender-based harassment, but also targeted attacks and hate speech due to my faith. So, Pakistan is majority Muslim country. Uh, majority people are Muslim. And uh, there are little uh, number of uh, non-Muslims are citizens available here. So Christian female journalists, they highlighted extreme level of uh, discrimination at online platform. People were targeting them just because of they are having opposite faith system. Moreover, it was considered by uh, community that if they are having Christianity, they can easily give sexual favors 
just because they are not Muslim and they can welcome such thing, it's normal for them. So that is the one of the significant issue faced by Christian female journalists in Pakistan. Class and socioeconomic factor also created uh, difficulties or problems for females. Uh, from Pakistan sector, female participant highlighted male colleagues targeted female co-worker from lower income backgrounds pressuring them for sexual favors in exchange for job advancement via social media. Many participants, they have discussed the same thing, that uh, it's especially male colleagues, they are targeting from lower income uh, families, employees, female employees, that they need more money for promotion. They need in any way, uh, they have to increase their salaries and they can do anything to get that. And they were targeting those female employees who are having low income background to ask for such sexual favors just for job advancement or promotion. So that was the one of the major issue faced by uh, Pakistani female journalists. And in England, working class female journalists face additional barriers and biases, including classist remarks and assumptions. Yes, uh, consequences were a diff bit different from Pakistan situation, but in England, female journalists, especially from working backgrounds, such as my one participant, she has a family background with working in a factories and all these area, and they were getting such remarks at online platform then they were writing about gender issue that uh, uh, you belong to a very uh, low family background so you have no idea you are not capable of doing all these things so in both country class and socioeconomic factors played a significant role to create hurdles in the way of female journalists moving toward the ending uh, concluding section this study reveals diverse resilience resistance strategies employed by female journalists in combating online harassment and gen gender-based discrimination. Strategies like digital self-presentation and online community building demonstrate participants' agency and determination to reclaim the narratives. Intersectional dimensions of experience shed light on how gender intersects with race, ethnicity, religion, and socioeconomic status to shape women journalists' challenges and resilience. The study highlights the announced form of oppression faced by female journalists of color and those defying cultural norms. Challenges and barriers despise commendable strategies. Participants still face psychological and professional impact of online harassment. Institutional barriers and gap in organization policies further undermine press freedom and gender equality in journalism. Theoretical implications. The findings support social feminist theory by exposing systematic gender oppression journalism. Intersectionality theories enriches the understanding of complex experiences of female journalists navigating multiple forms of marginalization. Finally, this research contributes significantly to United Nations Sustainable Development Goal 5, which is gender equality and empowerment of women and girls. By highlighting women's journalist experiences and resilience strategies, this study informed effort to address gender-based discrimination in various sectors, including media. Insight from this research can guide policy intervention, institutional reforms, and educational initiatives at creating safer and inclusive environment for women journalists. Additionally, it categorizes broader societal changes by challenging harmful gender norms and promoting equitable representation of diverse voices in media narratives and le leadership roles. So these are the list of references. Thank you so much. If you have any question and query, the floor is open for discussion. Thank you, Professor Ikra from Pakistan. I I wonder if you consider about Turkey's position uh, in your paper. Uh, maybe you can uh, present uh, Turkey's position between these countries uh, for the next uh, samples in Turkey. I already have collected data from Turkish journalists, and it's my big project based on four countries. 
So I have presented two. Uh, why I chose Pakistan and England? There is a big reason behind that. Pakistan is male dominant country and women are suppressed in Pakistan. On the other hand, England is considered a very empowering and strong uh, country for females, right? After conducting this research, it is revealed that it doesn't matter uh, if you are living in England or in a suppressed country like Pakistan, female journalists from all over the world, they are having issues such as discrimination, biases in media industry. So all those people who are idolizing uh, such countries, even like I just observed from my participant that the nature of uh, cyber harassment is more sexism in form from England participant, but in Pakistan still not so much, uh, you can say that. So that was a, one of the reason that I wanted to discover. And with the help of National Union of Journalist Organization in Bristol and their chairperson, they are supporting my project and I'm working on that. Hand it to Dr. Thule. I would like she add some words in this session and we move toward the next participant then. Dr. Thule, to you. Thank you, Ukra. Uh, as always, uh, it was a magnificent presentation, and it's I'm always delighted to work with you. Uh, yes, Professor Yuxal, um, uh, there is a project, um, and uh, uh, actually um, the Turkish uh, journalists, women, female journalists, um, ha were already interviewed. Uh, and in the next uh, symposium, symposium uh, under your moderation, <laughs> we would like to present it again. Thank you very much uh, uh, for your moderation, for Besna, uh, the, for um, uh, the, to Besna um, and to other participants uh, who are here with us, supporting us. Thank you very much. Thank we you. will be organizing our communication in the Millennium Symposium uh, in this November. Maybe you can present it there. Okay. Thank you very much for uh, participating in uh, this session. I will ask uh, to our other participants who doesn't offer their uh, videos right now, if they can open their video, we can also uh, say hi and uh, take a picture of all of us. What do you say? Can you hear me, please? If you open your video, we can take a, a screenshot and then uh, we can all share this in oh, social media. Hocam, ben Cem hocamıza bir şey sorabilirim. Kendisinin çalışması ile ilgili. Bu kompütörleri... Kim konuşuyor? Yan taraftan mı geliyor? Herhalde evet oradan gelmiş. Peki bir ekran görüntüsü alabilirsek aldık mı? Ben de alayım, siz de alın. Şöyle gülümsersek iyi olur videoya doğru. Evet. Thank you very much for this nice picture. And is there any questions? I can. No questions? Okay. And for the final speech, uh, I really want to uh, thank and uh, congratulate our friends, uh, Skuda University and uh, Professor Nazife Günge Hoca and uh, Süleyman Irvan Hoca, and our friends Besna and uh, who was the other uh, technical person? Ceren, Ceren Acun. Thank you very much. And thank you for the, our listeners and the other writers. I hope to see you uh, for the next symposium, maybe in, in Eskişehir this time in November. See you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. Thank you, all our participants. Thank you.